Welcome to How to Read a Data Sheet. This lecture will talk about the information you'll typically see in various technical data sheets and how to look through it and what information you might need and just sort of what to expect and how to figure out what you're looking at. I'm Clark Kinnaird. <clears throat> we'll get started. Okay, data sheets were originally written on paper. You may have seen paper around. It's sort of like a tablet, only very, very thin and actually disposable. Anyway, if you're not familiar with paper, uh, go to the library and check it out. Anyway, originally paper, you'd see it in booklets, uh, sort of a user's manual like you get, might get with some sort of electronics. Um, <clears throat> now just about everything is available on the web. Uh, if you have some piece of equipment or a component that you need to figure out, you can uh, typically Google it and find it either a PDF or some sort of online version of it. <clears throat> but you'll also, you know, if you're as old as I am, you typically want to see some sort of paper copy that you can take notes on and flip through. Okay, well what's in the data sheet is going to be a combination of uh, usually an overview of the device. And the de device may be very, very simple and might be pretty complex. You'll also typically find what uh, engineers might refer to as marketing fluff in there, which is it's not exactly advertising, but it's uh, some information about why this device has some benefits and uh, there's a little bit of a selling point if you haven't already you know, bought that particular component or piece of in, uh, equipment. Okay, then almost always you'll find some warning information that says, uh, depending on exactly what you're dealing with, how not to injure yourself or you know, burn down the house or at the very least you don't want to blow up that little uh, component or whatever it might be that's going to damage itself. Then you get into there's typically there's got to be some sort of specifications of the performance and uh, meaning sort of the technical details of it. How good is it at doing the things that it does, whatever that is. And then uh, again, depending on the complexity of the thing, some information on how to use the device. Um, sort of an instruction manual in some cases. Here's Wikipedia. I don't know what to add. There's a bunch of information here. Uh, sort of what I just said. So if you want more information on what data sheet is defined as or spec sheet it says, there's Wikipedia. Okay, let's look at a very simple example, which you already know about the piece of equipment, but uh, just kind of see what a data sheet for a stapler might look like. This is a Swingline 747 Rio Red stapler, 20 sheet capacity, and a limited lifetime warranty, and that's from Swingline, makers of America's number one stapler. Uh, this is all online, so I don't have a paper copy of this, but uh, none of this should, I guess, astonish anybody, uh, but just use it as an example. Okay, so as I said, you kind of expect there's some, be some sort of product overview. So let's see the product overview of this particular 747 Rio Red Stapler. Uh, gives again the name of it, 20 sheet stapling capacity, lifted line time warranty, number one stapler, got it. That is apparently the stock number. So S70 might be swing line, it's been around since the 70s. There's a 747 and 36 maybe means red, I don't know. But <clears throat> here's a little bit of marketing fluff. Owners of the swing line iconic and legendary red stapler staple with pride and confidence. So why would you risk your stapling performance with any other kind of brand? The metal red swing line is durable, noticeable, and efficient. It has earned the title of America's number one desktop stapler because it provides outstanding stapling performance time after time. Okay, uh, if you've never seen a stapler before, that doesn't really tell you what it is but uh, it certainly sounds like a good thing and, and something I would be proud to own. Okay, knowing it's a stapler, uh, of course there are some things to worry about. Um, they don't spend much time talking about the possibility of damaging the stapler, although, uh, you know, I mean, they, certainly if you put a tin can in it or tried to staple it, it's gonna jam. Uh, anyway, there's certain things you need to not do. There's things you should always do, like keeping your hands out of the middle of it, that kind of thing. So. Uh, this sort of stuff is typically going to cover the three bases of, you know, any sort of hazardous uh, properties of the device itself, misuse, and, um, and personal injuries that might come from whatever it is that you're reading about in the data sheet. 
Okay, so we get to features. Uh, the features of this particular stapler are that it is made of metal. Okay, so that would differentiate it from other staplers that are uh, made of, you know, possibly some sort of high impact plastic or something like that. The stapler can be opened in that it, you can open it and, and instead of having it, you know, bent over on itself like shown in this picture, it can open up to 180 degrees and then you can uh, tack things onto a bulletin board or something. So, you know, those two features might make you choose this particular stapler instead of some others. It has a 20 sheet capacity with a certain type of staple. So, okay, if you knew you had to staple, say, 30 sheet booklets together, you're going to look for something, you know, bigger. So this, or on the other hand, you weren't sure if it would do 14 pages. This will tell you, yep, you can use this. Uh, the stylish red color is certainly recognizable and iconic. 100% 100 performance guarantee um, and limited lifetime warranty. It would be interesting to see how often those are actually followed up on, but uh, maybe gives you some sort of feeling of confidence. In the case of this uh, particular device, uh, the specifications look almost like the, uh, almost like the features in that it, you know, color, red, material, metal, Performance guarantee, 100%, period of warranty, limited lifetime. You'd have to read the fine print to find out what that means. Uh, sheet capacity in here, uh, they get in a little bit more detail. In addition to selling you its 20 sheets, they tell you what thickness of paper. Uh, so it, it's 20 pound paper, which is sort of usual copy your type paper. But, you know, also paper comes thicker, um, you know, for things like uh, resumes or you know, cardstock, that kind of thing. And you can't put 20, 20 sheets of cardstock in this thing, so they're getting a little bit more detail-y. Uh, how many staples does it hold? 210. Uh, it falls in the category of desktop stapler, and the stapler type is traditional. Um, not sure what that means, but I'm sure there's some non-traditional staplers out there <clears throat> that would be the, the other category. Okay, so the, uh, the stapler was an example of uh, something familiar that you might, you know, if you already know all about a stapler, the data sheet is usually thrown away as soon as you open the, the package. But uh, there's, there's certainly more detailed and uh, maybe new to uh, you at some point in your career, some, something else. So some electronic component or a piece of equipment you're going to have to use. So let's take the next example, and this will be an operational amplifier, which is a very basic uh, building block for all kinds of analog uh, signal processing. So you will uh, definitely see these if you're an electrical engineer. You'll need one for your turbidity sensor, and it's, uh, it's good to know kind of what you're dealing with. Let's take a look at the data sheet for that. Okay, let's take a look at the op amp data sheet. And um, <clears throat> now here I'm... I'm got a view of the PDF file, so you might actually print this out if you were looking at this and, and really wanted to flip through it, read through it, uh, circle things, be aware of the, the arrangement of the inputs and outputs, that kind of thing. But an op amp is an integrated circuit, so it's a little chip. It's smaller than a stapler, but in, in certainly a lot of ways it's more complex than a stapler. Uh, and it's also less expensive than a stapler, which is a testament to our technology and the, the scale that <clears throat> we've been able to achieve in making these kind of complex devices very, very cheaply. So we'll take a look through these sections and see pretty much the same sort of information we saw for the stapler. Okay, maybe a product overview. So the first thing we're going to look at, and this is at the top of the sheet, um, part numbers, and this is page one, part numbers and key features and a pinout. In other words, what have I bought? And I can see on this particular data sheet there's a bunch of different part numbers an LM124, a 124A, a 224, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so there's a bunch of different part numbers, but each of them, each of that part numbers, is a slightly different type of quadruple operational amplifier. So I'd say a quad op amp, meaning that in that chip, which I would pick up and hold in my fingers, there's four individual operational amplifier circuits uh, all in the same package. Okay, and then on the left-hand column, there's a bunch of information about uh, features. So this is, again, you know, the sturdy, made of metal, iconic, it's a pleasure to own, and that kind of stuff information. But there's also mixed in with here, um, basically, a little bit of technical data showing, you know, what are the parameters of this particular thing, and uh, 
just a little bit surrounded by the fact that it says, you know, if, if it says it has a 0 0.8 milliamp typical supply uh, current, and then they add the words low. In other words, they're sort of saying, this is, this is great because it hardly takes any current. Your batteries will last a long time, that kind of thing. All right, anyway, uh, these uh, particular devices are going to come in a 14-pin package. And so we're looking at the top of this little thing, and it'll be about as big as the end of a pencil. Uh, with little pins sticking out of it. So we need to know when we're going to deal with this thing, you know, where are the inputs, where are the outputs, where does the power go? All that information is right on page one because you tend to have to refer to that over and over again. You know, at least in this particular example, it's all on page one. The uh, LM124, this whole family of devices, um, here's the description that's part of the, uh, the first page. Four independent, in other words, you know, the signal going through one has nothing to do with the signals going through another. Uh, single supply, in other words, you could run all of these from a single power supply, and a lot of uh, older op amps you need two, one for positive and one for negative, and that's not necessary here. Low supply drain uh, really says that you don't need to worry about running your battery down too quickly on these things. Uh, and then they give you just some uh, application. So if you happen to know that, for example, you're going to uh, build a DC amplifier, uh, this might be something that would give you the, you know, keep reading, keep thinking about buying this thing. Uh, standard 5 volt supply. Now the battery packs we're going to have are going to be a little bit higher than that, but you'll see uh, it can also go higher than the 5 volts. So as we read through this, just sort of gives me an overview of the device itself. Somewhere on the data sheet, there's going to be something about, well, which part number is which, and how do I read the part number and figure out which one I want or which one I've got. Um, and on the same data sheet, you know, in this case, and, and you find the same sort of thing in TVs or, you know, DVRs and things like that, they'll have the same information for a bunch of slightly different model numbers. And uh, they'll just say, well, by the way, this one has the uh, you know, high-speed USB port in addition to having 27 channels of something, something, something. Anyway, so you look at this uh, ordering information, you can figure out, well, which package? In other words, you know, do I want the little tiny one? Do I want the bigger one? Uh, which package? In other words, how big is the chip, even though the silicon inside is probably all the same? What temperature range do you need? Uh, how accurate are you willing to pay for? And, and these devices are probably tested and like the really, really good ones, they'll charge more for. And the ones that are good enough and work pretty well, they'll grade as a different uh, kind of, it's called binning. You put it in a different bin and say that one's less expensive, just like uh, fruit or something is, is sorted. Um, if you only need, now you see on this uh, data sheet, they're talking about a tube of 25, a reel of 2,500. Uh, all of that has to do with if you're in manufacturing and you're building, um, you know, a bunch of, of I don't know, uh, iPod docks or something and you want to amplify the sound of your speakers, you'd need a whole bunch of these, whereas, you know, what we're going to need is just a couple. We would not uh, buy these from Texas Instruments directly. We'd go to a distributor, you know, or Fry's or Radio Shack or something like that. So uh, we don't need to worry about this sort of quantity sort of thing. Okay, then we get to the part that's got some electrical symbols, and this will mean more and more to you as you get through this course and, and get into more of the electronics that uh, you'll be exposed to in some of, some of the rest of your career. So there's some sort of symbolic, uh, very simplified thing here. This is the triangle will tell uh, an electrical engineer, okay, I know what this is. As soon as I see that symbol, I understand that's an op amp with a positive input, a negative input, and a single output. So, so that sums up the whole thing for me, and I would then be interested in where are those pins, you know, is it pin 1 and pin 3 and pin 4, or what? What are the, where are those located? The other thing, if you're really interested, is what's inside, and in this particular device, each of the amplifiers, and remember there's four, has about 100 transistors and uh, a couple handfuls of other components. And it shows you there the diagram, which will mean something to you if you take uh, EE3322 electronics too. You'd know how to you know, make heads or tails out of all that stuff. We don't need to know that, but you might just be interested uh, in knowing the level of complexity. And uh, if you're comparing this device against others, you might get into the details of how they're made.
Okay, well, I said there'd be warning information. Uh, an op amp is not really going to hurt you. Uh, I guess uh, if you get certain kinds of them, the pins, I guess you could stick into your fingers or something. But in general, you're more worried about how can I avoid damaging this part. So these data sheets for this type of component will have some, something along the, line, uh, the lines of a limiting, limiting characteristics or absolute maximum. Somehow it's going to say, don't do more than, you know, don't overload this. Uh, don't go past these uh, voltages, these currents, this temperature, that kind of thing. So depending on, you can see they've broken it down into the LM2902 for some reason, a little bit more sturdy than all the others. Uh, oh no, it's less sturdy, so you can't put as much voltage on it. All the rest you can have anywhere from uh, 16 or 32 volts on that uh, LM2902. 2902, you can only go up to 26 volts. Um, so, you know, they're a little bit different there, even though basically it's the same device as the others. So they're worried about, you know, don't make it too hot, uh, don't solder it for too long. There's a, a lead temperature that has to do with soldering it onto the board, meaning, you know, get a, get a soldering machine that goes fast enough. So basically that's about the only way to break these little things is too much voltage too much heat for these particular ones so other other types of units it'll you know if it was a car don't overload it and don't go too fast if it's a wheelbarrow don't put too many bricks in it okay we come to the specification section this is for the op amp and this is because it's an electrical component will have electrical characteristics and this uh, has some information it says this is at uh, whatever specified free air temperature. In other words, um, you can see there's a whole column there for T sub A, ambient temperature. And there's another thing that says test conditions. And it also says, by the way, this is with a 5 volt supply. So things might be a little bit different if you have a 9 volt battery or uh, some other level. Anyway, so um, then there'll be the parameter, voltages, currents. Um, that's the two that we're going to see here. What test conditions, what temperature range, okay, divides the devices into a 124 and a 224 and a 324 and a 324K. Okay, so you know which column to look at depending on what device you have. Um, each of these is a measure and typically um, any sort of thing like this, you either want something really, really small that has to do with something like power dissipation or you know, you know, how much current is it drawing from the battery, or you want it really big because maybe it's the amplification that you can get out of this thing. So you tend to look at the minimums and the maximums. The typicals are sort of, well, you, you kind of expect this, but if it's in the maximum or the minimum column, you think, well, it, they're not going to sell this thing if it doesn't have at least, like, for example, on, on the first line there, uh, input offset voltage. In that case, you actually want a very, very small input offset voltage on the op amp. You'd love it to be zero, but they're saying we will not sell anything that's worse than uh, five millivolts, which is the units over on the right hand column. If it's worse than five millivolts, we'll, we'll say it's junk and we'll, we'll throw it on the floor or, you know, sell it cheaper as some other part number. And that's in the case of the 124-224 and the 324-324K. Uh, it could be up as high as 7. So, you know, it just tells you what level of performance you're getting for any particular part. And, then, you know, data sheets typically have two or three pages of this kind of thing, depending on how complex the part is. With a typical sort of data sheet, you would tend to have something like applications and say like, well, just, just to kind of get you going, typically you know how to use these parts if you're designing with them, but here's an example, you know, use this part like this to make a unity gain amplifier, this is the top part, or uh, 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 in the bottom one, it's actually a gain of nine. And, and I think when we get into your uh, uh, turbidity sensors, you'll have to do some things like this, uh, maybe not these exact circuits, but you know, whatever you end up with is gonna look sort of similar to this. So it's just sort of examples for things you might want to do with this part. In addition to the electrical specifications, someplace in the data sheet there's typically going to be a mechanical drawing. In other words, you know, this is, uh, this is what you're going to be dealing with uh, if you're going to put it into a board or a prototype system, something like that. So this thing is, let's see, it's a 14 pin, so B max is uh, 20 millimeters long. I think the parentheses are uh, millimeters. 
Anyway, it's 20 millimeters long or, you know, a little less than an inch, and it's uh, three-tenths of an inch wide. And this is the biggest package this thing comes in, by the way. The actual silicate is tiny down inside. So, you know, it will matter to you if you're designing a board that the go this thing goes into. How big is this one? Okay, so that previous package was what we call a through hole. You actually have to drill holes in the board to put those pins through it. This one is the... Uh, really what everybody uses these days, it's called a surface mount, a uh, small outline integrated circuit. So this is much smaller, the thing is uh, six millimeters, I don't know how to do the conversion to inches, and it's basically five by six millimeters, so relatively small and, and thinner. Anyway, so this would be for more high volume production, not for prototyping. The, the bigger package is easier if you actually have to you know, build something by hand, but this could be what you'd use in high, high volume production. And you'd make that choice depending on where you are in your design. Okay, so we see what the chip looks like. If you actually are in high volume production, these things, uh, whether they are one package or another, come on a reel that goes onto a, called a pick and place machine that is basically a robot that builds your boards for you. Um, and this is telling you, well, if you buy, say, 2,000 of these things on a reel, this is what the reel will look like, and so you know how to set it up on your robot. The data sheet I looked at actually has the box uh, dimensions for the reel, the box that the reel comes in. So it seems a bit overkill, but uh, I don't know, if you're building a shelf to put it on, there you go. Finally, one more thing you'll t you'll almost always find in the data sheet, and I'd call it the fine print or the uh, terms and conditions, whatever it is. There's a whole bunch of stuff at the back that basically says, uh, regarding changes, you know, we might make some changes, so check back often to make sure this is the latest version of the data sheet. Uh, any intellectual property is still ours, so if you reverse engineer it, we may come after you, which kind of goes to copying is forbidden and stuff like that. Resale, don't you dare. Once you buy it, it's yours. You can't sell it to another person. It's not for life critical application. So this has to do with uh, there. Most uh, most times you'll find that you don't want to sign up to put it in in life support kind of medical equipment without having some sort of special, extra robust uh, lifetime testing that kind of thing. It's the same sort of deal for military applications. Um, you know, those things are a whole different environment than most things, and, and even automotive applications, you know, if your brakes, uh, your brakes going out are a little bit more important than uh, the left channel of your iPod dock sounds a little funny. So they kind of carve out some, some special conditions for that kind of application. Okay, finally, I mean, the data sheet length is, is obviously going to get longer depending on the complexity of whatever you're working with. Um, so a stapler, I mean, zero transistors, that's one measure that uh, electrical engineers use to say how complex something is. And it was about three pages long, um, just operated stapler. Uh, the op amp has 14 input-output pins, about 100 transistors inside it, and about 16 pages of, you know, fairly detailed uh, information about how to, how to use an operational amplifier. Uh, looking at this one, here's an Intel uh, Gigabit Ethernet Phi. So this is the thing when you plug in the the cable into the back of your laptop uh, and actually get on the plug your Ethernet in. Uh, that has probably, I, I don't know, I'm, I'm sure thousands, perhaps a million transistors on that thing. It's only 48 pins because they reuse a lot of them and they're, you know, it's like ports within ports to get into that thing. But there's 300 pages of the data sheet for that thing. So, uh, you know, it, it's it's like a novel, uh, and then typically, you know, there's another good reason. You typically wouldn't want to print that out. You will have a PDF of that and can, you know, instantly scroll to whichever section you need. But, you know, the ma it's basically a manual telling you how to work that chip. Okay, so, the, you know, for mechanicals and uh, uh, computer folks and uh, civil and environmental folks, you know, you're going to run into the equipment and, and things sort of like this. We, I, as an electrical engineer, I use the Electrical component as sort of a, a, you know, that's the example I'm most familiar with, but the same sort of information will be in the data sheet. It's just like mom and dad always said, it, you know, at a last, last resort, read the instructions. Um, it's not bad advice to at least, you know, know where to find the data sheet uh, before you start uh, welding things together or whatever it is you do. All right, see you in class.